Hi, everybody. Welcome to Consider This Artificial Intelligence. I'm Katherine Nichols, Senior Coordinator for Faculty Relations and Travel at Carolina Alumni. I'm happy to see some folks in person and hi to the virtual folks too. I'd like to thank you all for coming out and joining us and a special thank to our panelists who have taken time out of their busy day to come talk about this interesting subject. I will not talk any longer and hand it over to your very able moderator, Max Orr, who is Executive Director of Carolina Public Humanities. Thank you, Kat. Let's put our hands together for Kat Nichols, Catherine Nichols, thank you. Um, yes, we wanna welcome you all to this uh, important event, consider this on AI. Um, very briefly, I wanna explain who Carolina Public Humanities are and what we do, we're the public outreach arm for the College of Arts and Sciences and it's our job to make sure the excellent Faculty and scholarship at UNC are shared far and wide with communities throughout the state. So go to humanities.unc.edu, you can see some of our wonderful events. I would like to mention a couple of them, take a moment to just say tomorrow night we have a wonderful music event at Flyleaf Books with Don Landis. Um, we also have wonderful weekend seminars coming up, one on the uh, fall of uh, Rome in Spain, of the Roman Empire in Spain and Egypt. And then one of our panelists will be doing our next week's talk at uh, Flyleaf Books, our Humanities in Action talk on Wednesday, uh, and that will be on AI with Mark McNeely. So uh, look forward to, to that and also to all of our events. Please go to humanities.unc.edu to check out our full offerings. We, of course, want to thank Carolina alumni, um, a partner with Carolina Public Humanities and so many things, including many of the projects that I just described to you, our Humanities in Action program in particular, but we have been working with Carolina alumni since I've been here since 2009 and some of our greatest programs here in Chapel Hill as well as throughout the state. So I really want to thank uh, Carolina alumni. And if you are not a member of Carolina alumni, you can join even if you didn't go to school here and get all the benefits of that membership. Uh, I also want to thank Carolina alumni members, especially the lifetime members whose generosity helps support all of Carolina alumni's activities. Um, I mentioned, of course, Kat Nichols. We want to thank Kat Nichols. Let's put our hands together for Paul Bonici back there. Uh, although we have a, a, a more intimate group here, we have people online, and they're accessing uh, that through uh, Paul's magic over there. So what we're going to do quickly here is I'm going to run through, quickly introduce the panel to you. Um, and each of the panel uh, members will give you something to consider maybe a few things to consider about AI. And then we've collected questions from the audience, so we have some divided up into sort of categories of questions. But we, of course, hope that we'll have room, uh, time at the end, to take some questions from the audience in here. Um, but it should be a wonderful uh, conversation. You'll notice, because this is, uh, we are already in the world of AI, we have full bios here. Uh, this is well before AI, the uh, QR code. Uh, but So if you'd like to read panel panelist bios in particular, but I'm just gonna quickly go through and introduce them. We have Moet Bonsal, as said, John and R, and Louise Parker, professor and director of the Merge Lab and the computer at the Computer Science Department here at UNC. He, as you could imagine, is our expert on computers, in particular natural language language processing and other things we'll ask him to explain uh, and whatnot. So please welcome Moet Bonsal. Uh, we also uh, welcome uh, Matt Bernacki, who's a Donald and Justine Tarbot Distinguished uh, Scholar and Associate Professor in the School of Education. His particular expertise is on learning strategies and technological interventions in education. Please put your hands together for Matt Bernacki. We have Thomas uh, Hoffweber, is a professor of philosophy here at UNC. Um, if you, he mostly works in metaphysics, the philosophy of language, and the philosophy of mathematics, all of which just scream AI, don't they? Um, he's also looking at a project, I had to, I don't read uh, C, uh, CVs, but I did see he's working on a project on human extinction, uh, in particular concerning what humanity should do to prepare for its own extinction. Uh, let's hope we don't go there tonight. But anyway, please put your hands together, Thomas Hoffweber. We're delighted to welcome Boyi Kim as a postdoc fellow at the UNC Arts and Humanities Grant Studio, as an accomplished artist, uh, herself arts professional with a passion for music and a drive to make the arts accessible for all. Uh, in particular, a focus on arts accessibility and management using tech uh, in art. So please put your hands together for Boyi Kim. 
And finally, we have UNC's, I have to say, Mark uh, McNeely has become definitely the UNC's point person on AI uh, as a professor of the practice of marketing at Keenan Flagler Business School. And as I mentioned, I believe he did a panel last night on AI for one group, and he'll be speaking next week. And even this summer, he helped many of us faculty members uh, begin to grapple with how we're going to approach AI in our own classrooms. Now, before we begin, I just say my own experience with AI has been uh, brand new. Uh, this year, for the first time in maybe 11 years, I'm giving blue book exams. So that might be what we call the sort of the negative side of AI or the precautionary side of AI. But on the other side of that, we've had some of the most incredible generative discussions using AI in the classroom, where we take materials that we've been reading and we ask AI what it thinks about them or put two authors together, and then the students end up critiquing AI and saying how it could be better, what they've learned from it. So uh, we see both sides of this in the classroom already. I'm really looking forward to what our panelists have to say. So without further ado, why don't we go from left to right and take it away, Moet. Uh, great, so I think this is good enough, right? I don't need to pick up the mic. So should I just give a summary of what we do? I, uh, okay. uh, yeah, so let me maybe start by defining some examples, right, of what uh, AI around you looks like. Uh, I think right now you'll see a lot of, uh, so, so I guess I'll first talk a little bit about my lab. Uh, so we are in the computer science department. Uh, I've been working on AI probably for 17 or 18 years now, uh, back when it was uh, just called machine learning and uh, neural networks were also not that popular back then. I mean, they were popular before that for a, for a brief bit, then there were not enough GPUs to make them useful for things which means uh, not enough computers or compute uh, or uh, processors, right? So then it fizzled out for a bit, but then when we had more data and more processors, right? Bigger computers, uh, then people started realizing its uh, power. Uh, so things, examples of things that we work on, uh, one is uh, multimodality, which means that as humans, right? We use a lot of different senses and modalities, right? We speak, uh, we see, uh, we listen, Right, we have movement. Uh, so multimodality is sort of the new frontier of AI, uh, where you don't want just things that are looking at language alone, or vision alone, or action alone. Right, you want models that can combine all of these things together. So some examples of that would be: Can I take a long video, right, and ask the AI model uh, to automatically tell me what's going on in the video? Right, describe the video in language, uh, or ask. You can ask questions about the video, right? So you can already start imagining applications of this in disability assistance, in education, right? A lot of scenarios like that. So we actually have a lot of uh, grants and collaborations on how to use multimodality for improving education in classrooms, right? For example, a student's assistant, like a teaching assistant, right? So the, the, the dream is that uh, every student, right, can have their own personal AI teaching assistant uh, where they can automatically extract a lot of knowledge from millions and millions of documents and thousands and thousands of hours of video, right, much more efficiently. And the same thing for disability assistance, right? Imagine that someone who is not able to have very good vision, but they have a phone out and they're taking a video of things around them. Now, using AI, I can, I can automatically convert it in my ears to the model, AI model telling me what they are seeing, right? So they can convert the vision, the images, and the videos to things in language in their ears. Uh, so there's a lot of applications on multimodality. Two other things briefly before uh, I should uh, let people, uh, others continue, is that uh, one is explainability. That is that uh, something that we work on, uh, which means that can we basically explain, ask the model to explain why it made a certain decision, right? So that's basically another future almost one of the top three important things, right, that the AI community is looking at and will be looking at for the next several years is that how to make these AI models more accountable, right? And through that, what I mean is one big way to do it is to make sure that they can explain why they reached a certain decision, what was their reasoning process, right? Just like humans, you can explain why you reasoned to a certain decision. Uh, so that's one area that we do a lot of work on. And then the third area is efficiency. Uh, where can we also make these models much, much smaller and faster so that we can put them on mobile phones, right? There's every village in India or many countries, right, that are under-resourced, uh, there's always cell phones, right? It's reached every corner of the world. So can we make these models small and fast enough to work on cell phones so that they can help agriculture, 
uh, in advice. They can help in climate change advice, right? They can help, most importantly, in healthcare advice, uh, right? So for that, they need to actually run on something small and not have the requirement of 100 GPUs in a lab, right? Which even most universities, right, cannot set up, right? Only big companies have uh, 100, 000, like thousands or 2,000 GPU clusters. So that's something to consider. Exactly. Um, well, Matt. I try to leave this here. Everybody hear me okay? Cool. All right. Well, great. I um, appreciate the order because that was a really nice setup. Um, so my name is Matt Bernanke, and I'm coming at this from uh, the perspective of somebody who cares about the learning process. I work in the School of Education. Um, and just to give a little bit of kind of a, a foreground, then some of my background. Um, mm -hmm. As we study teaching and learning, I would say that AI kind of serves as a tool, a threat, and an opportunity all at the same time, depending upon what part of the day it is for folks like myself. Um, and I would say that all good artificial intelligence is based on good human intelligence um, for many of the reasons that Mohit well, kind of foreshadows here. Um, so my background is in educational psychology and I conduct research and teach in a program um, in the learning sciences. Um, and I teach courses on personalized learning where we take data from learners and run that through our understanding of how learning works, different kinds of learning theories and we use the data that students provide so that we can adapt instruction to either leverage things that they're already good at or try and accommodate things that they you know, could use some support so they can learn more effectively. Um, that involves a whole other area of research and I teach on learning analytics where we need to figure out what are the right ways to extract data uh, from the ways that students engage with technology and one another uh, using a lot of the methods that, that Mohit's describing so that we can draw those insights, interpret those insights with human intelligence, make good features in our models and allow the AI to actually notice the right things about a person in an environment, feed those into a model, give resources back to a learner so they can be more productive. Um, so just to give a quick slice of kind of how I use artificial intelligence, it's very much just in the, the elder machine learning kind of phases of this. It's not generative language, it's not large models. It's really taking what we know from theories of learning, instructors' insights, and instructors' appreciation for their own students so that we could try to figure out who's going to learn well in a class based on a very short period of time and based on what an instructor could see if they got to watch each individual learner, but they have 300 of them or 400 of them and can't see all of them at the same time. Um, so within just about two weeks of course data, our group can predict whether or not a student's going to get the grade that they need to move forward in their science major in their very first large lecture class with about 80% accuracy. And this is all predicated on working with an instructor who can tell us, here's my, here's my syllabus, here's all the content for my students, here's how I wish they would learn with it, and we can kind of organize that and saying, oh, okay, these are the resources they use to plan, these are the ones they use to figure out, well, when should I be co covering certain kinds of topics with my studying, and maybe what kinds of cognitive strategies I should be using with slides versus readings versus practice uh, resources for quizzing myself. These kind of tools, we can take human insights and apply new data on top of them, organize students' activity better, and then feed that human intelligence back into our artificial intelligence tools and build those prediction models. The explainability piece is really huge here where the human intelligence we feed in, we get back out. So whenever the artificial intelligence spits out a model that says when students do A, B, C, D, E, they're likely to do better. When they do you know, F, G, H, whatever, they're likely to do worse. And when they do it at these times, those are particularly beneficial or not. Those kind of go right back to the instructor and we talk through it and kind of self-explain what's going on in the model. Does that match our understanding of the learning process? And then how can we develop resources to try and hit each of those individual predictors in that explainable model? And that's generally the same way that most AI works, where any data that we mine, however large that, uh, that corpus is, all draws upon human intelligence, or sometimes lack thereof. Sometimes, you know, that's what bakes in the biases, it would bake, it's what bakes in the representation, and it's where our tools can get us in trouble as well. Um, so that's where it is both opportunity and threat um, the last piece of this as an instructor is similar to the blue book problem, right? So we need to get back to, well, what are we trying to assess? How do we measure student learning? And at what level do we need to understand whether they know things or not? AI is really, really good at doing all the declarative factual knowledge work for us. 
It's pretty good at doing procedural work for us. It's getting even better at doing conceptual work for us. So the remaining areas that we can assess cleanly would be kind of these application problems where all of your answers are nested within a specific case and you would have to do your own thinking because it's all referenced around the single case and you can't go back to the larger language and, and the larger spaces easily right now um, to do that kind of assessment. So we need to figure out how to constantly stay ahead of technology so that we can still be good at knowing what students know with the kind of exams that we're describing. So that's kind of an existential threat to assessment in higher education. Uh, it is leading us back to paper um, and we'll see where it takes us next. Um, the last bit of this, and then I'll turn things over, is this idea of it being an opportunity. And I would say it's an opportunity to accelerate learning. So there's a lot of centers that are being funded now which are not only about collaborative learning with students and students, but how do we collaborate in a human AI teaming kind of scenario where we can offload some of those things that machines are more efficient at than we are? And how do we save some of those insight and creativity challenges for a human who for now is ahead of what a large language model or other kind of generative AI is able to do or some kind of large corpus uh, algorithm can mine from existing data. So that insight remains uh, presently something that we can handle uh, and we can collaborate productively to offload everything else to someone who's going to do it faster, even if that someone is not a human. Uh, thanks, yeah. So um, I am going to just talk a little bit about why AI is interested for philosopher. Uh, interesting for philosopher. Um, I um, want to focus particularly about the uh, particularity of intelligence that we can find um, amongst ourselves and how it contrasts with the kind of intelligence that we might find in um, machine learning models. So it's important to keep in mind that the most intelligent creatures that we encounter and have encountered for the last who knows, who knows how many years is just other human beings. Um, and we are all very similar to each other. So the kind of intelligence we exhibit is ultimately the same. Um, but it's important to um, recognize um, what might be special about that by contrasting it with other forms of intelligence. Um, so you know, if everything that you see is all the same, um, you don't recognize what really might be special about it. So one of the options here is that um, by looking at a totally different form of intelligence, we can find out what's really distinctive about our kind of intelligence. And the question is whether or not the kind of intelligence that we find in machine learning models today is fundamentally similar or fundamentally different from our human intelligence. So just to illustrate, like how does our intelligence work? There's many different aspects to it with like vision and so on and so forth. But one of the crucial aspects is our thinking and reason. So we have beliefs, we have desires, we reflect on our beliefs, we revise our beliefs, and we act in accordance to what our desires and our beliefs would support. So if I want this and I think that's the best way to get it, then I do this particular thing and so on and so forth. So this is the kind of intelligence that we exhibit. It's based on belief, desire, psychology. Um, it involves representations of the world. Um, it involves you know, rational reflection on our own beliefs and so on and so forth. So is this how intelligence in general should be understood? In particular, a particular kind of intelligence that involves let's say conceptual thought or language or um, things like that or agency? Um, or is it just one of the very special kinds of intelligences that we are? So to understand that it's useful to think about a very different kind of intelligence than our own. So until recently, the best example that we could study was the octopus, basically. Right? The octopus is about as alien of a form of intelligence as we have so far encountered. It's a, it's evolutionary connection to human beings, I think, goes back something like 500 million years. Um, the closest, uh, you know, the uh, latest ancestor that we have in common. Um, but the octopus is still ultimately very similar to us. It has eyes, you know, it's an embodied creature. It has neurons. Some of the basic, you know, um, functioning of the neurons, as I understand it, are very similar to our neurons and things like that. So the octopus is very interesting to study intelligence contrastively, but it's not that alien from us. Right? The other case that would be really interesting would be a true alien, like a space alien that might arrive and might be fundamentally different with no evolutionary connection at all to us. And another option is a form of intelligence that just arises through some other means, like machine learning. And then we can think about, you know, what kind of intelligence is that? How does it work? Does it do similar things than we do? Does it represent the world? 
Does it have beliefs and desires? Does it have values? Or is this whole language of psychology totally inappropriate for understanding how this kind of intelligence works? So the kind of artificial intelligence we see arising nowadays is a, the best case study to contrastively study intelligence, our own intelligence, and um, whether or not intelligence fundamentally has to be like us, has to be similar to us, or that we are really a special case of how intelligence could be realized. So this is one way in which it's very interesting for philosophers to study. I have a few more minutes, or can I oh, bring another going. one? No. Yeah, okay. So another one is um, a question that's connected to value. Um, it's related to the first one, but um, this is the question about um, why are we special, or are we actually special? So our standard value system includes that we are distinctly special compared to other creatures, other non-human animals. So for example, if there's a limited allocation of resources, most people, every, almost everybody would agree that it's the right thing to do to allocate those resources to human beings rather than to mice. If there's a limited amount of food, the mice have to go and the humans get the food. Now, there's, there's a you know, debate about what justifies that different treatment of non-human animals and human animals, but one option is that our more sophisticated minds. It's ultimately our intelligence, our ways of, um, you know, thought, our connections to each other that um, do not apply to mice. Um, so the justification for giving a special moral status to human beings is often tied to broadly intelligence. But now the question arises, what happens if um, machines develop a level of intelligence that rivals ours or surpasses it? Would that mean that they would join our moral community as one of the further members? And in particular, if they surpass our intelligence, would it mean that they deserve the resources more, just like we think we deserve the resources more than the mice do? So this question is one about just the status of human beings about our values um, and um, the, you know, the, the, um, the moral status that we might have. Either, either we might have a special moral status or not. Either we're just on a scale, a scale that could be surpassed where creatures, other creatures could have higher moral status than we do, just like we think we have higher status than mice do. Um, and um, this might be a question that will become urgent when, um, you know, AI surpasses our levels of intelligence in the possibly near future. So, um, so this other question about value um, is, is another, let me bring up another wrinkle, and this is the wrinkle about whether or not we should welcome this, whether or not we should welcome that um, um, our levels of intelligence will be surpassed by other creatures, just like, you know, that we could feel some sense of pride that we have created, we as human beings in general, creatures or, uh, you know, creatures in the broadest sense or uh, systems that surpass our intelligence and therefore would indeed be more valuable than we are and they indeed should get allocations of resources. But, so this, there's some sort of like sort of transhumanist project in the background here where people think that humanity is just a temporary stage of the development of intelligence and it's a good thing and we might get extinct in this process but that's not so bad because what, what is left behind is something greater than us. On the other hand, of course, we might go extinct um, and what's left behind is nothing greater than us. It has maybe no value at all and no moral status and it will just nonetheless be um, our demise. So these are all sort of big questions about you know, our status, um, the kind of minds we have, the intelligence we have, whether or not intelligence is tied to how we think of intelligence, how we describe each other's minds, and, um, and so on and so forth. I, I had a feeling we'd touch on extinction at some point. Extinction has come up, yes. <laughs> Boy, you can. I'm going to talk about a little bit about impact of um, AI on the arts. Um, throughout history, perceptions surrounding AI's role in artistic expression have um, undergone significant changes. Well, initially, there, um, there was skepticism about whether machines could replicate or replace human creativity. However, the technology, as technology advanced and artists began experimenting with AI tools, perceptions gradually ch changed. One early example is The Painting Fool by Simon Colton, and that is an AI program that generated original artwork resembling various artistic styles. So that, that pushed boundaries and bringing broad curiosity. 
And over time, perceptions toward AI in the arts continue to evolve. I, artists, um, AI artists embraced AI as a powerful tool for creation, ex creative exploration. For instance, musician Tyran Southern collaborated with Ember Music AI platform to compose an entire album called I Am AI. And this collaboration demonstrated how human can leverage AI as a creative partner to explore new possibilities. Um, this shift in perception paved the way for exploring numerous potential impacts of AI on artistic expression. Um, one significant impact is creative enhancement. Um, artists can use generative models like deep art or runway ML to generate novel ideas or visual styles that inspire their own work. And another impact is democratizing access to arts creation and appreciation. With platforms like Google's Art Palette or Adobe Sensei powered tools, individuals without formal training can engage with um, arts creation processes more easily than ever before. Uh, um, additionally, artists can explore, ex artists are exploring how AI generated visuals can enhance audience exp experiences through immersive installations or interactive performances. For example, Graphic Anadol combined data driven algorithms with architectural spaces to create mesmerizing light projections that respond dynamically to audience inputs. And building upon these impacts, it's important to recognize that rather than being an object of warning, responsible use of AI empowers artists by um, automating repetitive <coughs> tasks and freeing up time for deeper exploration and innovative innovation within their craft. Renowned artist Mario Klingemann has been at the forefront of using neural networks in his artwork creation process. Um, he views these algorithms not as replacement, but rather as uh, collaborators and that help him discover new possibilities within his medium. Um, as we inter integrate, uh, integrate technology into our artistic practices, addressing ethical consideration associated with using AI becomes crucial. Um, first, it's important to address bias in the data, data sets used by machine learning algorithms by ensuring that these um, data sets are diverse and rep representative. We can prevent artworks produced by AI from perpetuating harmful stereotypes or reinforcing existing inequalities. We must also consider issues related to authorship attribution when collaborating with intelligent systems. A topic, uh, this topic explored extensively by artist Anna Riddler, who investigates questions surrounding ownership when working alongside generative models. Um, furthermore, privacy concerns arise when using personal data or facial recognition technologies within interactive art, in, art installations, an area where responsible data handling practices become paramount. By pro proactively addressing these ethical considerations through ongoing dialogue between artists, um, technologists, ethicists, and incorporating them into our uh, framework, we can minimize potential harms while maximizing innovation opportunities offered by this transformative technology. In conclusion, so we have um, explored uh, evolving perceptions toward AI in the arts from skepticism to acceptance. We have, been, uh, we have seen how it can enhance creativity and transform audience experiences while emphasizing responsible um, integration through ethical considerations such as bias mitigation, authorship attribution, and privacy protection. By taking these new, uh, measures, we can ensure that AI-generated art is both innovative and fair. Thank you. Yeah, Mark McNeely. Sure. So when I think about generative AI, for example, ChatGPT, it's a major milestone that has really far-reaching applications and implications. When I think about implications, it's what does it mean to us as individuals, our organizations and society? Applications is how we can use generative AI for our advantage. And a lot of thought leaders have likened it to the discovery of fire or the invention of the internet or the printing press. 
And how it's different is generative AI can more directly engage with humans and more fully perform human functions. So I think of it as a democratization of AI, right? It's not hidden in the back somewhere behind a curtain, it's people every day are using it, right? And you don't have to be technical because he uses natural language. And that not only affects organizations and individuals, but societies uh, near and far future, both positively and negatively. Um, there's a statement, uh, it's the first law, Kranzberg's first law, technology is either neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral, right? So it really, it depends on, on uh, who you are and how, that, how it might impact you. And so we need to holistically understand the applications and implications of these ever more powerful AI tools on our organizations and ourselves. And generative AI is just that, right? It generates content. Genesis, you know, the coming into being, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew words, in the beginning that come from the Bible. So generative AI can take input, right, using natural language text or voice um, uh, or images now, right, and create new text, code, images, videos, 3D models, et cetera. And when you look at ChatGPT, right, just itself, that tool, it can answer questions, it can write, it can code, it can summarize, it can explain concepts, it can brainstorm, it can translate languages, it now can take images and, and voice for, for input, and it can replicate many things that humans can do just as well as the average human can, and actually better than a number of humans can. And it, and it's only going to get more powerful and fast, right? I just was, I keep up, I get these articles, like 10 articles, well, about 20 articles a day on AI, and one was about Apple's putting in a, a billion dollars, right? And then Microsoft's putting in $3 billion. So that's, you know, that's the currency, right? It's, a, it's in billion dollar chunks. And in terms of integration, one of the things you're going to see where these applications appear, you're going to have standalone applications like ChatGPT or Anthropic, right? Um, but ChatGPT and other generative AI tools like that are going to be integrated into existing applications. So it's really going to be, and it's happening at a staggering pace. So generative AI is not going to appear in those standard app, standard standalone applications, but at Microsoft, for example, it's going to be integrating it into Office and Outlook and Teams and Adobe Photoshop. So you can, as you know, when you're building a PowerPoint presentation, all you have to do is say, create a PowerPoint presentation on X, and it will generate that PowerPoint presentation for you, right? So it's gonna take time for these tools to be absorbed. Um, it took 30 years for electricity uh, to be adopted in every industry. Uh, and there's, there are definitely some um, challenges, but they're gonna fundamentally change how we work and how we interact socially. And as I mentioned, there's different standalone application types, right? There's a standalone applications like ChatGPT, going to be places where it's integrated into other existing applications like Salesforce. Um, there could be standalone applications where I have my own large language model as a profession, as a professor, and I can query it with the, you know, it has the data that I'm interested in. And then what I would call standalone enterprise uh, applications where you could have a customer service chatbot, right? And the upside of it is the productivity could be up, increased up to 50% in some cases. Uh, creativity uh, is another area. Gross domestic product could be increased significantly. Access to knowledge at a very low cost, especially in poorer neighborhoods or emerging countries. And theoretically, it could solve humanity's most complex problems. DeepMind, which is a part of Google, they are, their mission, they basically have a two-step mission, which is the first mission is essentially achieve uh, AI, super intelligent AI, right? That's step one. Step two, solve all the world's problems. I mean, <laughs> that's basically that's basically their mission, right? Um, but a key skill in this is gonna be prompting, right? Roger Bacon, the founder of the scientific method said, to ask the proper question is half of knowing. So you have to be able to ask the right questions. Now on the downside, it's like, can we get, you know, we set up the, the AI to do X, which is great, and if it does X, that's wonderful, but sometimes we set it up to do X and it does Y. Right, that's called the alignment problem. Things are misaligned, right? There's a lot of legal risks to be sorted out. Who owns the data that's generated? Who pays the people whose data was scraped and taken? Um, cognitive job impact, so pretty much any white collar job is gonna be impacted. Anywhere from 25 to 50% of the tasks that we do will be automated. There's the fake news impact for democracies. 
questions about equality of access and overall, right, the, you know, like, are we gonna be around at the end of this? So when I think about personal impact, especially for people that are in the workforce, there's a saying that you won't be replaced by AI. That's the good news. Bad news is you'll be replaced by somebody who knows AI, right? And so if you look at the traits I think you need in the future, um, David Brooks, who's that New York Times columnist, he said, in the, in the age of AI, major in, being in, major in being human, right? So AI is gonna do some certain things well. What is it that humans can do and that you can do that's gonna differentiate you? And so I think some of the things that will differentiate humans is you still need domain-specific knowledge to, do, to write the right prompts and to evaluate what the generative AI gives you. You still need imagination, right, to make connections, to come up with ideas. Now, AI can help you here, but you can use it as part of your process. You need initiative to go drive projects that are important to yourself and your organization. You need to have, if more and more of our work is, and the writing part is done by machines, it, how we speak and how we uh, make, dis, not, not make decisions, but how we speak, um, how we present, how we are on our feet, uh, our, our charisma, our extroversion become more important. Um, organizational skills, you know how to get something done in an organization, right? And do you have the networks to create, to make that happen? Um, a big thing is gonna be adaptability and resilience, right? Is this future is gonna be extremely dynamic? I mean, not only the technology side, but we see things happening geopolitically where it's gonna be a very different world than the one we've been in. And of course, generative AI skills. And so to summarize this, I'm just gonna just leave with a quote from Alvin Poplar, right, the futurist, and he said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So that's kind of where we're at now. If, if, we, if you, you or the people you care about want to participate in this future, you're gonna to have to unlearn some of the things you've known before and relearn some new things. Let's put our hands together for our panelists, their wonderful contributions. Well, we have, um, I have a, a wonderful set of questions that we've collected from uh, the online, from when all of you signed up, you had the opportunity. Um, I, I love this little question, it says, is there a good side of AI? And I think I've heard from everyone here that there is potential good side. So we're gonna put that one aside there and we'll get to the other side of that question, I'm sure. Um, let's start with some basic uh, how-tos. Uh, this is a question from one of our uh, attendees. I'm unclear as to how to offer prompts. Tell it what to do without getting overwhelmed. Are there suggestions for how to engage with AI for an amateur user? And what I might suggest is our different panelists to say, so for example, if someone is interested in art and wanted to take that on, I mean, I'm only familiar with ChatGPT at this point. So I guess I would just ask um, if anyone wants to say, how do you start? with AI, if you have some, I, I was very surprised when I asked my students, only half of my students had ever tried it. So there I was in the classroom worried about the blue books and only half of my students had ever even used it. So, um, so how to, where do, we, where do we start? Say for example, maybe Matt could offer something if you're in education, you wanted to be a better learner, is there something you can do? Is there something that you can do as an artist? Um, and of course, Moet, if you'd like to suggest how you could develop your own neural networks and whatnot. So please, whoever would like to start. I mean, I think maybe, maybe learning is the first place to start because you know so much of what we needed to learn with the, the birth of the internet and the process of search is kind of the same basic skill set where asking the right question is the right way to get started. And we already do that whenever we need to go Google something. Um, and we get better at it as we realize when we evaluate what comes back that we ask the core question and then we start to refine our question and iterate and iterate and iterate until we can figure out how to bring that kind of expertise that we have in knowing the problem that we're trying to solve and then trying to decompose it into the right words to narrow what what terms we need to give to a technology in order for it to mine correctly and give back the things that we actually need. So that's that search as learning paradigm, I think, is probably the, the thing that we need to circle back to and then kind of, you know, do our own kind of internal cognitive task analysis of like, well, what are we trying to do in the first place? Trust ourselves, use our language, and then use whatever tools in front of us to see what can be for us. So is there a particular uh, program that you recommend for doing searches? online for that? Is any of these tools, ChatGPT, 
I'll, I'll defer to those who use them a lot more. Okay. Um, I think the sensibility is that we already use in a lot of places okay. can be used in other places, and then folks can think through more of like, well, how do you write a prompt rather than offer keywords mm -hmm. is kind of the new, the new thing to learn. I know Mark, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I was going to say it, it's you know, it's really about your workflow, right? You have a certain way of doing accomplishing your work, right? And it's a habit, and it it works for you. And what you need to think about is how do I take this new tool and integrate it productively into my workflow? And so some of the things you're doing, like, hey, I'm gonna go do a search. Well, wait a second, maybe I should try generative AI, right? And, or I wanna go get a picture from the internet. Well, instead of getting a picture off the internet that maybe doesn't fit, maybe I'll try and create a picture using generative AI, right? So your, your workflow is a set of habits you have and you fundamentally have to change those habits. And the only way you do that is by trying, thinking about as you go through your work day, hey, can I use generative AI in here? Right? And especially what easiest way to do it, I think, too, is think about rather than I'm going to go do search, go to Google, I'm going to go first maybe try generative, try, try JetGPT, or you can use Bing, which is Microsoft version where they take ChatGPT because they own 49% of OpenAI who makes ChatGPT. They put it into their search. And so it will give you not just the, you know, the, the answer, but it will give you the websites it pulled the answer from. So you can go check the websites it pulled the data from. And oh, by the way, it can create images for you. So that's really what I found for me a great tool. And that helps us uh, avoid misinformation, which yes. happens as well if you have links to actual things. So we did find in the classroom some quotations that, as far as we could tell, were not from the author at all, yeah. we could not identify them. Bui, do you have any suggestions for art? Um, yeah, I think um, in the AI era, I think it's much easier to be an artist or magician because all you can do is just Google like painting AI. This, the, and there are a lot of like platforms that uh, enable you to draw something or create something. Um, just only with a um, few words, like I want to draw something like drinking cat cat a cat drinking milk and and they can create a, a lot different versions of um cat cats drinking milk so um like as long as you have concept or um your ideas to create then ai will do it for you well the the copyright issues will be beyond that but as long as it's uh the starting point it, it can be like it's that easy Okay, uh, yeah, so. Uh, Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, there. You should leave it uh, to the table. That was AI. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, <clears throat> like Matt said, right, I mean, you basically uh, should think of it like, uh, so when you play with Google, right, I mean, you, you've probably seen that you've learned how to use its language, right? That's another thing about human agency, right, that we might get into, like the real issue of human extinction uh, is not, the movie style human extinction, right? It's more about extinction of human agency. Uh, but but that's a different conversation, right? Maybe for later. But but you probably noticed, right, that you start talking to Google the way, right, it can give you the best answers. So all these current models are exactly the same way, right? They're just better like search engines, but now also generative, uh, which is still an, like a long way to go. But but the idea would be the same, right? You can go to OpenAI's chat GPT API or GPT-4, and now there's a GPT-4 vision version, GPT-4V, uh, where you can have conversations about images and also generate images. So the model will have a conversation with you, uh, both replying in text or audio, but also through images. Uh, so the idea is that if you want the best kind of answers, right, out of the model, for example, you, can, you might have a task where you have thousands of documents, right, and you want to just get a summary. But then you can also personalize these summaries. You can you can teach the model almost collaboratively what kind of things you want from the model. So this is a whole area called in-context learning, where from a few examples written by you, you can actually teach the, some of these APIs to do many new tasks, right? They can create the, your resumes for you. Uh, they can create, like a lot of people are like small businesses or people who don't have that much money for their business are using these to create websites and user interfaces for their businesses, right? So so you can, with a couple of examples of teaching the model, you can actually make it do many, many new tasks, right? That it's not primarily or initially designed for. So that's one example. Uh, and then like Boyi said, right? I mean, in terms of uh, 
being able to automatically generate images or videos, right? I mean, you can uh, personally, right? People are using these to create greeting cards, right? For holidays or people are trying to use these to create uh, sort of these trailers, like small movie trailers or business uh, business advertisements, right? Where you don't, you're a small business, you don't have enough money to hire some fancy, right? Hollywood company to like make a video for you. But you could now start using these tools to start getting more and more realistic uh, short trailers or videos. Uh, but then there's also bigger applications of this, right, in things like education where, uh, so we, for example, uh, had a recent uh, project where can we teach large language models so we can talk to it to automatically generate complicated diagrams. So if you're trying to visualize a very complex concept, right, that's much easier to do it through visual diagrams, right, or uh, figures as opposed to explaining it verbally. So now there's also new capabilities being built uh, where you can actually have, you can talk to the model and it can start generating short videos for you, complicated diagrams, figures. At some point, right, I mean, very soon, you can also just create automatic slides, right? If you're giving a presentation, you can automatically generate the presentation through these models. So so basically, I would, I, my takeaway would be for you is that it's, luckily, you can teach it to do a lot of new tasks, even though it's not meant for it initially, just by giving it a few examples. Um. Search, which always seems like you're going down a tree, you know, you're going down a branch and you find certain things. And there's something about AI that feels like it's trying to access human intuition in a sense that it's intuiting what the answer is you want. Thomas, do you have any sense about uh, the epistemic implications of this? Are we teaching, and about what we talked about, you had some really powerful saying, don't worry, we're getting to the heavy stuff, folks. And, you know, but in terms of uh, uh, how it is we think, and humans tend to, so for example, my, my brief example is, my wife and I have the exact same model of cell phone, but for some reason mine says 5G and hers says LTE, and we're in the <laughs> same place. When you ask why on Google, it just gives you all the wrong answers. Oh, you wanna change your setting or this and that. It does not intuit why our two phones are different. And that's something I can explain to all of you right here, and you just immediately got it. Um, any implication for the for sort of putting human intuition and and the epistemic implications of that in in AI? Well, I mean, it's certainly the goal for the AI to be smart enough to know what you're after and try to understand the intent of the question. My my own experience with like interacting with the, the language models is that they're they're quite good at this already. I mean, they when you so for example, so just to get back to the um, the last question about somebody asked about like, how could I get started, right? I feel like the, the easiest way to get started is to go to the um, OpenAI website, pull up ChatGPT and ask it to explain something to you. You know, explain to me like how machine learning works or anything like that. And then you ask follow-up questions and it's very good in, in getting at what you're really asking about. So the follow-up questions often are really on point. Um, and it's much easier that way than, than using a traditional search engine where it's much harder to really put the search terms in to get the sense. So, so my, you know, I mean, certainly the target, the goal of these models will be to, to do exactly that. You know, if you ask a particular question, like what is it, what, what are you after? And um, it has to be, you know, trained to, to be good at this. Matt? Add on to that. Um, do that and then ask it about something you know a lot about. Mm -hmm. And if you can ask better and better questions, you can start to probe the limitations of the depth of its knowledge in an area where you have knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you can see when it's gonna deviate towards the typical human understanding, the synthesis of human understanding versus the deep expert version of understanding. And it's gonna vary depending upon which topics we choose because of what language is available, what kind of resources are available for it to mine. And then the depth of the features that your questions should draw up like something that might be really situational or something that requires some of that human imagination or ingenuity to kind of see the deeper feature that models pres presently aren't typically quite able to do unless they're in particular pockets. It was very gratifying with my students in that we looked at material we've been studying for two weeks in the class and we asked it and they were all very like, no, no, that's, you know, they had, so it's in a way a confidence builder as well in that we tried to ask it more more in-depth questions and we were not getting better answers, honestly. So that's also, I guess in some ways, humans got a little confidence about their own abilities at this point still. For now. Yeah, for a little, for now, right? So um, I have a really cute question here. Uh, is bot chat going to replace invisible friends for the isolated young? 
What about, what about the human connection, the potential for the human connection between humans, human loneliness, and AI? Yeah, I definitely think that's, I mean, it's happening now. So there's several applications, Replica is one, um, where you can have either boyfriends or girlfriends, right? And you can set them to more, it's, um, it's more it's about conversation or it's more um, intimate than that. Um, so yeah, so that is the, that is, it's not the future, it's now, right? And they're just these, these, for, for people that are lonely or even just any, anyone that, you know, chooses so, um, you can have this perfect person, right? That understands you, that's always available, that always is willing to listen, you know, that can interact with you and, and really give, put you at the center of attention. And I think. Right now, that's not embodied, but they are, you know, robotics is increasingly getting better. And so you will marry up robotics, right, um, with AI, and you will have the ability to replace your spouse or when you might have three or four of these around, right? So it's like the question then becomes like, do I marry someone or do I have four or five of these things? And they're working around my house. And then when I want, you know, company, I just, you know, just pick one and, or, or whatever, right? And, you know, that's your, that's, that's it. And so what happens to humanity? What happens to society at that point in time, right? And you're already seeing that with young males. Young males are only, you know, in, in almost every large university, it's 60, 40 females to males. Males are, to a large extent, dropping out young males, right? And what are they doing? So the ones that are dropping out? They are doing video games. They're you know at home alone, and so they they're going to be the prime target for for this. But on the flip side, if you look in China, it's a lot of times it's the majority of our females, right? And they you know there's this there's the AI boyfriend, right? So I mean I think it's the future, um, whether it's going to be a good one or not, you know, we'll see. It's not entirely the vision of extinction I had going the route of the, that. Well, that's, how, that's pretty how we are going to end. It's going to be like, I mean, you're already seeing fertility rates in, in advanced countries going down. I mean, Japan is cratering, China's cratering, we're flat. Hmm. So, yeah. Okay, let's get, uh, let's, uh, we, we haven't even hit the heavy stuff yet. We're getting there. Um, let's talk a little bit about arts. You know, one of the things, um, you, you mentioned the word embodied, and I think about the artistic process in so many ways. Now, I know that there's, there's been computer art for 50 years that's wonderful and has a certain tactile, tactile sense to it and the time that goes into doing it. I'm wondering about the uh, creativity. Um, how do you maximize creativity in the arts? And as embodiment of the arts, I'm thinking about someone who spends all their time painting a painting and feeling the textures of the paint. Um, do you have any any sense about how important that is or how we generate the creativity without the sense of sort of, it feels instant to folks. It feels like a shortcut to some people. How is it not a shortcut? Well, like I said before, like if you have some kind of concept that you want to generate um, like in the, in the past time, you need to really um, pay attention or pay a lot of time to really um, finding your technique to draw something or sing something, sing a music. Mm -hmm. But um, in, the, in the AI session, AI era, you just need to um, um, order the AI to do that. And, and then you can create your own, it, it's like your own. So it's like um, with your ideas, then anyone can create something mm -hmm. and, and pay more time to explore deeper and like like my from my um um example um tire and southern um made made the ai platform to um, compose her own entire album instead of mm. her doing it so this like so the ai just uh, reviews her preferences and things like that and creates unique rhythms or melodies for her to sing so it's it makes them like freeing up their time to do something else. Yeah. So any of our three panelists on this side, one of the things, a complaint that I've read, and I and I think it's somewhat facile that people would say this, that AI is just a gigantic plagiarism machine. 
right? And that, and so I guess I'd ask, um, you know, maybe from an ethical standpoint, if that's the case, from a learning standpoint, is that the case? And even from the technological, you know, what is the data that's being mined and scraped? Um, what's the difference between this and plagiarism? Whoever would like to take that. <laughs> and, um, it's similar to what you were describing about kind of how your students could evaluate what the products were of the AI and find them a little bit wanting. I, it's a great way to plagiarize towards a C if, you're, if your instructors are grading in ways that value um, kind of deeper understanding. Um, so if we think about kind of like what the, what the tasks are, um, there are pieces of learning and pieces of production that you know it's useful to iterate on and it's costly to produce. So similar to what Lily's describing, like there are pieces of the generation of art that are physical production and you know you, you can spend a lot of time producing something and decide that you don't like it. So you'll see like studies, many, many, many studies before a painter goes to canvas sometimes that are all just charcoal on, on paper or whatever to try to make some decisions before iterating through them before you go to a final product. Um, a good use of AI and what I would describe as like an opportunity uh, with some of these like querying large language models is to try to figure out, well, how do I need to ask questions? How do I need to form my own ideas? How do I need to work up drafts? And you can work them up very quickly up until the point that you need to kind of take ownership of the work. So it is a plagiarism machine if you make your assignment simple enough that you can be satisfied with the outcome. But I if you don't, you can make it a really productive teaming. Exercise. No, I can, I can appreciate that from a pedagogical perspective. And one of the things I'm doing when I assign papers, I also send out the chat GPT answer already to them and say, this is what chat, you know, here it is, you know, can you do better than this? Yeah. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm actually even thinking about from this point of creating art. I've heard artists saying, I see my art in that AI creation that it was yeah. great. So Moet, can you speak a little bit about how it's seeking out the content? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so, so a couple of uh, aspects to this. One is, uh, yes, this is a big problem. So there's been a lot of uh, Congress hearings, right, about all these topics. So the two big sort of negatives that the Congress hearings for like OpenAI's uh, CEO and uh, a lot of experts from the community, uh, the two sort of big issues that are pending, right, are one is uh, uh, copyright and plagiarism. The other, which we'll probably get to soon next is, uh, all the vulnerabilities and uh, the misinformation, right, and uh, misuse. So for the first point about uh, copyright, uh, I think a lot of these companies uh, sort of uh, very nicely just ignored this point in their Congress hearings. But there were other experts, right, from the AI community and our colleagues from the more academic side uh, and some senators actually that uh, pointed out that there's two things, right, that uh, need to be focused on very strongly. One is avoiding, uh, no, one is offering transparency into the training data, right, when these models are being released. Uh, and the other one was uh, prohibiting them from being trained on uh, artists' copyrighted works. So these are suggestions. Obviously, uh, it's not easy to put these in. Uh, but from the technical perspective, there's two aspects to this. One is closed models, and the other is open models, right? So in academia and some companies, a very small subset, we all are pushing for open sourcing, right? So everything should be open sourced, which means that these models are open and everyone knows what's going, going on behind the scenes, right? What data they were trained on, what parameters, what information do they contain, what kind of outputs are they good and bad at, right? And closed models or closed source or black box models, in other words, uh, you have none of this information. You can just play with them and hope for the best, right? You can try to attack them, you can try to fool them, right? But you'll never know what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, so that's why there's another aspect of this, right? That the push for open source. Uh, but if you have to deal with closed models, uh, one sort of technological advance that our community and a lot of that work also in my group uh, that we are focusing on is how to be able to remove information from models. So that's the key point, right? If these models are already released, right? They're closed. They have already been billion dollars of expenditure on them. They're not going anywhere, right? I mean, they'll not just become open source because Right, maybe Congress told them to. Hopefully, they should, but but maybe not uh, that easily. Or they'll also not just throw that model out and say, okay, now let us build this open source model for you all and waste billions of dollars. So one middle ground is that what if we can come up with some uh, machine learning methods that can. So so there have been papers and methods that have shown that you can take these models and I can extract your credit card from them or I can extract your home address, right? Because they were trained on all this data. 
and I can actually ask specific, I can do specific things to the model's parameters that will make them spit out your private information. So that part was the first uh, right discovery that hey, like these models are all trained on all this uh, stuff. But that's the problem. Now the solution that we focused on and some other groups in the community, so we had a recent paper which showed that can you try to delete information from the model, right? Directly at, in a black box model. You don't have to retrain the model from scratch because that's too expensive. But can you take the parameters of the existing model and do certain things to the parameters such that this information about your credit card or your date of birth or your SSN number uh, gets deleted? Right, so this is a sort of this uh, sort of cyclic problem, right? So we showed that you can actually delete information up to a big extent, uh, uh, but then I can all then I also showed that I can come up with an even better and more clever attack method that can then still extract that information in other ways. Then I built an even better cleaning method or uh, what's called a defense method to remove that information. Then, I, right? Then I can build an even smarter attack method or extraction is what it's called, information extraction method. So this is kind of this classic cybersecurity kind of setup, right? Where there's bad actors and there's good actors, right? So they're always competing with each other. You just need to, right, like decide which one will stay ahead of the game. But the good news is because of this chicken and egg cycle or this repetitive attack and defense cycle, we are still reducing the amount of private information more and more, right? Because the attacks have to become more and more clever to get your private information. So that's still a good sign, right? That's moving in a good direction. But it's not reached zero percent yet. Right, that there's there's still no guarantee that the information has been completely deleted. So this is a hopefully good example from the technical side of like how we can still uh, remove this private information uh, with the models that we have to deal with and are not going anywhere. Thanks. Yeah, yeah this is. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, yeah, please. Well, so so if I use Bing Chat to generate an image, have I created that? Right, you use the words create, right? I cre did I did I create that? Versus like creating a painting is one thing, right? Or creating a, a book is one thing, but typing in a prompt and having it turn out a you know a fairly attractive piece of art, right? You might, I mean, have I done anything in the really in the creative process or not? Is it, huh? You, no, you do not have the copyright. You're right, trademark office. But just generally, as a philosophical question, like, have I, do I get the credit for that because I wrote a little prompt? Well, you don't have the copyright, but I mean, can I take can I take credit for it personally? Right. I guess there's a question. So I'd be interested to hear what, especially Thomas. I can. Yeah, please. You know, that's like a, one of those um, subtle questions, right? So you are causally responsible. Yeah. You cost some process. You yeah. started it, right. that resulted in the thing. Yeah. But uh, there's many ways to start something that you can't get credit for. You know, like for example, if I pay an artist to make a painting, I can't get the artistic credit for right. it. So then there's a question about, you know, what part of the process do you have to be, how do you have to be involved in, in the creation of the artwork yeah. so that you can get artistic credit for it, not just causal credit that you are causally right. responsible for it. And that's, you know, that's a subtle question. I mean, this question goes back, like, in, you know, there's this whole, field in philosophy of, philosophy of art where people debate this about, you know, why does only the, the painter get credit and not the person who made the paint? You know, the person who made the paint often had a substantial contribution in the sense that this kind of shade of blue didn't exist before this person figured out how to make it. But normally you don't get any artistic credit, even though without your, you know, sort of clever work mm -hmm. in making that paint, that painting would never have existed. So there's no easy answer to that. You know, this is a substantial question about what aspect of the creative process warrants artistic credit? Mm -hmm. And that that question is becoming, you know, obviously very urgent this, well, yeah, these I days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. The, the day I said in my class, well, I created this, and I, and I stopped myself. I said, I didn't create this thing, right? I can't say I created this art, right? So again, like creation could just mean you are a causal trigger of the existence of it. And in that yeah. sense, you did. You did yeah. create it. You know, yeah. but then the question when you ask, like, am I the creator? You want artistic credit. You know, you want not just be the person who is the starting the causal chain that results in the artwork. Yeah. And that question is not answered by you typing in a prompt. Right. Yeah. I think also, I mean, uh, like, yeah, the analogy would be you go to an artist, right? And you uh, give them a specific kind of demand mm -hmm. of like a certain story that you want to be portrayed 
or uh, right represented in the painting. Uh, so in that sense, I think you were the inspiration, uh, but they are also making it for you, right? So it's a different situation. Whereas, uh, and it would be fine even for the AI models if they were not trained on any copyrighted mm -hmm. material, uh, like the gentleman the audience just mentioned, then you could still probably claim uh, partial, right? Uh, I mean, inspiration and ownership. The problem is more when they take your prompt or like the demand that you had about a certain kind of situation and a scene, uh, but then if it uses uh, stitches together, copy pastes or stitches together pieces of copyrighted existing artists uh, art to build that, then that's probably the sort of uh, bigger problem. Uh, whereas if it did something original, then you should be able to take partial credit for it. Uh, so then in some sense, our credit belongs to neither you nor the model, right? It's, it's copy pasting other people's art, which is where like the thing I forgot to mention is another technical aspect of this is the explainability thing that I started in the very beginning, that we should be able to have these models very accurately tell us how they came up with a certain output, right? That's becoming more and more crucial for generative AI, not just uh, like discriminative or uh, classification based model, right? That we're just classifying decisions, like predicting. If they're generating things, then it's even more complicated, but even more important to have the explanation of how this thing was generated. Because then it can tell us, right, which pieces were from where, and like, right, like just like you said, the documents from which the answer came out from a search, mm -hmm. Google search, right? But then imagine the same thing for generating a painting. It should be able to tell us, okay, these, these are the pieces I'm sort of using. This is the training data example that I'm sort of giving most weight to or zooming in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if it comes out with the answers of like, uh, yes, I use this painter's, uh, right, like painting number one, and then the second painter's painting number two, and then I mix and match them. Uh, I mean, it's still legally, right? Obviously yeah. a very complicated situation because it still does something of its own to mix them and like maybe add the third thing. Uh, but at least we have some accountability. Uh, right, because uh, I mean, and, and that's not an yeah. easy problem, just to be clear, right? Because explainability is a very open ended challenge. Mm -hmm. Like, even if it can spit out some, just to uh, have one more thing to consider, it can spit out an explanation, but then you don't even, you cannot, like, there's no guarantee that that explanation is correct, right? It mm -hmm. can just fake an explanation. <laughs> so then you have to also prove that the explanation was faithful, <laughs> right, to the actual process that the model did, which has its own uh, method, like machine learning methods to try to do that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. there's, there's so much about human creativity. We have this sort of Promethean sense that this is, you know, but all creativity, I mean, I think we all, anybody who's an artist is probably influenced by other artists, you know, and so in this sense, it's just speeding up the process of human creation. I know, Matt, you wanted to enter in this conversation. To acknowledge the, the idea of the, the openness and the transparency here as uh, Mohit's talking about, as you make mo your models inspectable, sourceable, and transparent, we, we can kind of lean on how like the open science movement starts to disentangle some of that and how like the whole process of meta-analysis and synthesis exists as we try to build knowledge where you know people will ask a not novel question of the literature but then they'll have a novel solution to how do they sample all the prior studies, how do they weight them appropriately, how do they make their own decisions to try and come up with a common understanding, like the typical effect of reading on paper versus reading on print is you know, this much different based on all these other weightings and all these other people. And we have systems for being open and transparent about where the data come from, whose data we're using, how are we you know, putting our algorithms in, et cetera. And those same kind of things, I think, probably end up running up against copyright law and intellectual property law eventually with this kind of, you know, how can we be transparent in our methodologies and how can we be just in our decision making about how to handle all those things. So we've... Just to be clear, sorry, like the question you asked, uh, uh, I mean, inspiration, uh, I think is fine, right? It's more about the copy pasting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not an expert, but someone in some other similar conversation, and I think Bowie might know the answer better, Someone told me that like in terms of legal, uh, like art law, I think you cannot copyright style, right? I think, is, is, does that sound correct? That You, that you cannot style, copyright style. Artistic style cannot be copyrighted, right? So in, that sort of answers your question that it, it's okay actually to have inspirations from other people's style, but mm -hmm. it seems like that's not even copyrightable, but it's more the actual art pieces. Any comment on that, Lee? Well, um, if I add on to that, like, these days, I, I have some, some kind of similar question um, by myself, and I started to think about like creation as a, like as like a director, more of like this these days because my background is also performing arts, and there is a director who um, 
runs or, or order the actors to do something, some kind of style. Mm. Um, so it's like, not like we don't genuinely create something anymore, but we can like direct AIs to um, create something or like gather something mm -hmm. out of it. And so I can be a, a artist, sort of like director. <laughs> so maybe it's like, um, Terms can be the idea of terms can be changed next, like next few years in the future. I mean, maybe in the future yeah. will be those that can't do prompt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have these these uh, conversations. We've touched on copyright, um, and I have three questions here. I'm going to just read the three questions out. Um, just curious about what AI regulation might look like implications of AI for labor. Let's let's focus on regulation for right now. Are there any federal government organizations working to regulate the AI industry? I might stretch that to uh, artists' conventions that they might have, you know, some sort of best practices. And then, of course, in all of this, um, is it possible to implement ethics and morality, some sort of standard? And if so, which standards? So what about regulation and who makes the decision on what ethical use of this powerful tool is? I think it's going to be different by country. Um, China is going to be very heavily regulated because they're afraid of the impact to the government and people using it in ways to, that will danger endanger the government. Um, Japan is going to be very, very pro AI, hands off, because their population is going like this. And so they need to make up some, some capability through artificial means. Europe's going to be very focused on privacy. Uh, they'll be stronger probably on regulations than the U.S. will just because that's kind of the norm, right? It's a different value system. Um, and the U.S. is still just trying to figure it out, but driven a lot by Microsoft's and the open AIs because um, the, they're the ones that are basically going to the government telling them this is how you should regulate us, right? Which is a little bit scary because regulate, regulations allow, create barriers to entry, right? That's what you want to do as a company is create the regulations that favor you and keep new people out, right? So it's going to be different um, by country, depending on the country's situation and cultural value. Okay. Any other comments on regulation or ethics and morality of standards? Word to um, the copyright uh, laws and things like that. I'm not even um, an expert on that, but I heard um, the Europe countries, they already allow the copyright that's generated by AI. So, um, it's, and and here still there are a lot of people who don't like um, arts created by AI. So it's, it, it depends and it, it really um, changes quickly or or somewhat um, slowly. So um, it's really important to, for, um, artists to familiarize themselves with uh, relevant copyright laws in, in their areas, in their society, I would say, yeah. We certainly know um, Isaac Asimov's rules for robots. Um, do you have any sense, Thomas, how we might think about the morality that we embed in AI, or is that even possible? Yeah, so that's that's obviously a big question. You know, there's this whole problem that was touched on earlier about the alignment problem that, you know, the, the AI systems are supposed to align with our human values. Um, and there's a real problem, how to, how to solve that problem. I mean, so one is just thinking about the Asimov's rules, right? So um, modern um, AI systems are based on machine learning or not on explicit instructions. So they're not given a particular instruction about what they're supposed to do, they learn from data and adjust the weights in the network and then produce output on the basis of that. So um, in that way, you know, the easiest way to, for a system to learn about morality and values would be on a set of data, let's say actual human behavior, right? But that would be a terrible way to learn values. <laughs> um, so the, the problem is, you know, I mean, as you mentioned this earlier, so if you wanted to solve this problem and give some sort of morality or ethical values through some sort of training process. Like, how would you do that? Like, what kind of values would you focus on? You know, would you, you know, like, uh, you know, anyway, so, so this is like, this is a, a substantial and unsolved problem. And um, it's, um, it's significant. So like how, 
you know, like modern systems like ChatGPT are trained is through this um, reinforcement learning through human feedback. So that um, humans are ranking outputs that the model gives in a, on along a number of different dimensions, and then the model gets um, fine-tuned on the basis of that. Um, but that's totally different than saying, you know, like Asimov's laws, you should never do this, you should never do that. Um, Which, so, if we've read the book, get people in trouble. <laughs> exactly. So and even if you could do that, so that's the other, of course, question. If you could, you know, just give some explicit instructions and then, um, you know, the model has to follow them. So there's, there's, there's a number of problems, you know, from the, from the stories as well as just in reality, right? So if the, the model has to, if it's supposed to act on certain rules or the AI system, it, usually the rules alone will only be effective if it has also some other information about the world. Could have misinformation, it could misinterpret, the rules could be badly stated, and so on and so forth. And then on top of all that, there's the question about what values and rules should there be? There's no agreement in humanity among morality when it gets at least to a number of different cases. So there's wide agreement about some basic things, but um, there is no um, widely uniformly accepted value system that you could just somehow figure out how to incorporate into an AI system. So morality itself is an unsolved problem and that yeah. you need to solve that problem first before that approach yeah. could work. Oh boy, this is getting harder and harder, isn't it, Matt? But time's running out, you know, I mean, uh, this, this needs to be done soon. I haven't even got to the dark questions yeah. yet. So, but, but the layers to what you're describing are like, it, it's the human in the loop idea, right? So like the model learns from itself and gets feedback from the consumers of the model, right? And then the, those inputs help the model train in a direction of the feedback that it's provided. And when, you know, that, that's really productive when it's all the consumers who want, you know, data provided in a different fashion than, you know, our household bot, whatever it is, spits out the answer. You would say, no, tell it to me this other way. Like if it had the units wrong and it kept giving you Celsius and you lived here and you don't know what that means. Um, simple things like that. And that can all be, you know, coded by where, where your geography is. Um, but it's kind of the, the which human problem, right? So like if we need to accommodate humanity through simpler decisions and the data that's coming out of things, versus if we need particular kinds of humans to be the, in that feedback loop, there's a space there where there's a, a class of folks who are like ethicists and whatnot, who we probably want to maybe consult a bit as we careen towards whatever we're careening towards. So this is, I mean, this is the, the key question then would be, you know, the implications, uh, the question is quite simple, can AI be controlled, right? And I guess the question would be, I mean, in one way I could, you know, we, we might imagine, oh, it's out of control. It's just generating beautiful art all the time and we can't <laughs> stop it. That's one way. But then when we think about military applications, uh, right. you know, making, making decisions, when we think about, again, this question of human beings having figured out how to negotiate between rights claims so how could a how could a computer? So I guess we're down we're down to the questions of human extinction or whatnot. Can AI be controlled? Why is it that we hear this alarmist language about it, and yet at the same time we're also told that this is an incredible tool and we should embrace it? Um, the big question, and I've got easier, smaller questions over here, but let's get right to it. What is the risk? Can AI be controlled? especially when we think about the difficulty of controlling human behavior. Nobody wants to bite. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, a lot of the Congress hearings uh, and the CEO sort of, right, uh, debating through this, I mean, there's definitely some uh, things that most of them agree on uh, is that we need some guardrails, right? So it sort of connects back to the morality question too. Uh, that we do need some guardrails uh, in the sense that they shouldn't, they should be careful stress testing for security and societal risk, guardrails against biosecurity and cybersecurity, and then some broader social effects, right, that most humans agree on. Uh, so this whole alignment thing or reinforcement learning from human feedback, uh, the bigger issue here is that we actually run models using these uh, methods, right, and we've actually developed better methods than these. But the problem is the human feedback is still not complete enough, right? It's not representing all of humanity. It's very biased, right, towards certain cultures, ages, right, genders, all kinds of uh, social biases. Uh, so that's one sort of risk, right? We've shown that a lot of these models, we've done studies showing how they, are, they have a lot of social biases, gender bias, race bias, skin color tone bias, all of those. So that's the very basic sort of first 
uh, bias, right? That these, I mean, you've probably heard a lot of horror stories, right? About AI being used for, uh, right, crime uh, prediction uh, and who should get like a lease, right? Who should get a, a, like, who should be allowed to rent in a certain neighborhood, right? And you can imagine how, uh, right, blatantly uh, wrong these models can be, right? For certain categories. So that's the first risk, right? That most people, including Jeff Hinton, right? Who is sort of known as the godfather of AI, right? He's one of the Turing Award winners, uh, which is like the Nobel Prize of uh, Computer Science. Um, so that's the very basic risk, right? That first most people uh, agree on. The other one is more watermarking, right? Which is this whole idea of like connecting back to plagiarism that more like models should be able to have a watermark, right? All of us know what watermarks are. Right, so so there should be some accurate way of the model telling us which thing was generated by a model versus human, right? So you basically it means that if you if I generate an a, an artistic uh, like painting, uh, if the model is generating it, there should be a watermark behind it, right? Generated by OpenAI Dali three. But again, the problem is you can easily fool that watermark, right? So that's the whole attack and defense uh, right battle that I was talking about. There's also methods that can like basically delete that watermark, right? Uh, and then there'll be better ones, and they keep fighting. So that's the second one, right? That models should be able to have this, like we need to work towards having guardrails to be able to at least tell what was model generated. The third one is like joblessness, right? So that's the other sort of societal risk. Uh, there's some discussions about this, right? That, okay, maybe the money that's being generated from productivity, right? Because of AI's productivity, right? Should be going to the people who lose the job. But then there's also other angles, right? People say that, uh, I mean, uh, when uh, horse carriages went away, right? I mean, uh, or the industrial revolution happened or, the, or, or cars were created, right? Then, then other kinds of like Uber driver jobs got created, right? So th that's also a very long debate. So there's those three sort of more basic uh, risks, right? And then uh, the, the bigger ones are getting into uh, military, like you said, right? Like, should we have uh, military robots, right? That can go crazy on the field, Right, I mean, they, they trigger somehow in the wrong way, right? They misunderstand our instruction, right? And like start shooting back at us or, or whatever, right? I mean, as civilians. So that to me uh, is one of the bigger uh, real risks, right? So, so there's a lot of debate also about that. Like one solution, partial solution proposed is that first of all, your own models should have guardrails, right? You should, you should build guardrails in your model saying that I will not do these X, Y, and Z things ever, mm -hmm. right? Whatever the prompt be, right? Uh, and then the, uh, but then people are also saying that DOD, right, Department of Defense should have its own, uh, right, uh, like instructions and guidelines of what not to be using AI for, uh, right? So that's the fourth level. And then the last level is human extinction, right, based uh, guardrails, uh, which uh, is a very, very uh, sort of uh, confusing debate. Uh, so there's a whole camp, right, that thinks that, okay, no one should be working on AI, so we should just stop it, right, because we are going to all die. Uh, but there's, a, there's some sort of middle ground, right, where a lot of sort of more uh, maybe uh, regular people, I shouldn't say normal, uh, right, are, are more concerned about human agency extinction, right, things where, we, we, what that means is that, right, when we started using, uh, say, uh, machines, right, then we started, like, when the machine revolution or industrial revolution happened, uh, we started losing uh, more of our physical jobs and, like, we st stopped doing much physical labor, right, so, like, right, I mean, muscles and all that, right, our physical capabilities reduced. But then we were using a lot of our brain. So we started using a lot of mental capability. Now the problem is that because ChatGPT is going to do all the mental math and summarization and email writing, everything for us, maybe we'll also start losing our mental agency, right? Or, or like like the, the, the agency to make decisions or, or be creative. Uh, so, so that kind of extinction is one kind of extinction that's more real. The other one at the extinction level, I think a lot of people do agree uh, that uh, small level extinctions are a real risk, right? For a very good example that I sort of read in the news recently is that there was some small village somewhere in Europe uh, which had to actually cut down the water to some big data science center because it was it had so many computers like running AI that was using up so much water, right? That in fact, uh, they had to cut it out because like there was water maybe running out for the local citizens. So that triggered something in me where it could happen, right, accidentally if you give it too much autonomy, right? Suppose there were no guardrails. There was no person actually checking that they've used too much water, right? No alarm, no limit set, just like your credit card mm -hmm. limits, right? Then what could have happened is like that whole water of that small village could have been evap like used up, right, by three days with no one checking. So that's the small level sort yeah. of, right, extinction event where uh, natural resources, right, these kinds of things are bigger things we need to worry about, not like robots coming, right, and like shooting at us. Yeah. Uh, it's more about, hey, like what if they overuse resources because they are being using reinforcement learning to learn that the best optimization for them 
is to do something that helps them succeed. Now, if they realize that objective function is maximized by using up all the resources that it can get, right? All the electricity, all the fuel, yep, then we, we are got done, a problem. Right? Then Earth's gone. So. so that's that covers this question here. How will AI impact the power industry? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you want to add something, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I thought on that exact so following up on Mohit's uh, point. So I guess the um, like a, it's a classic illustration of the, the dangers of AI along those lines is to consider the analogy with chimpanzees. So chimpanzees are, um, and chimpanzees as compared to us, so chimpanzees are physically stronger than we are, but slightly less intelligent. But they are on the verge of extinction. And their extinction is solely caused by what we're doing and not what they're doing. So mm -hmm. their own survival as a species, species is essentially out of their hands. It all depends on what we're doing. And the reason why they're on the verge of extinction, despite being physically stronger, is exactly for the reasons that Mohit was talking about. So that, you know, we take over the resources. We use the space that they need to live in, even though we don't have anything against them. It's not like, you know, we sort of like, oh, our chimpanzees, we want to kill them all. It's just that we need the resources that they also need. And, um, and so we step further and further into their territory and they go up to the verge of extinction. And this is sort of the analogy that is the, concerning one, what could happen to us, that the, um, the AI systems become more autonomous, they get more agency, we get less agency, they take over the resources, and um, eventually we'd lose control, mm -hmm. and we become like the chimpanzees. It's just our future survival will just depend on what the AI systems decide to do, and whether or not they allocate us any further resources. So, so that's the one that uh, we should be worried about. And we started with the child's friend, which was very happy, and this is a, this is a getting a dark ending here, but I can see this. Um, yeah, please, Mark, please. On warfare specifically, they've been testing it. And the, the, the interesting thing about AI and warfare, it, it is extremely fast, right? Because it's computer driven. It's extremely aggressive and it's very unpredictable, right? All the things you want it to win in warfare. Um, and right now with the US military, that's called the kill chain, right? The decision process to take out the enemy. And right now, the human, there's always supposed to be a human in the kill chain, right? Helping make those decisions. The problem is humans slow down the kill chain, right? Because you don't think as fast as a computer. And so the question is, will China have human involvement in the kill chain? And if we don't, if we do and they don't, that puts us at a disadvantage, right? So there's going to be, I think, you know, a desire to really remove humans from the kill chain in order to be able to win the war, right? Or win that battle. So that's, I think, one of the fundamental questions. Well, two things. One is what's in the kill chain, right? What controls are there in the kill chain? And then also the ability for us to respond. You could think about um, Go. So AlphaGo, right, was mm -hmm. created um, to win at Go against humans. And it started doing things that we had never predicted, right? And so again, it's very, it's very fast it, and it was extremely aggressive and it's very unpredictable. And that's the same thing you'll be seeing replicated in warfare. Well, we've had an incredibly generative discussion without the use of AI tonight. So uh, with, our, with our database up here, um, I would just end by saying, I think an interesting thing is uh, what do we owe to computers if they become sentient? I wonder about the effect on humans when we boss our, when we boss things around all the time and have them do things for us. But I guess well, that's a problem we'll have to cover in another consider this. Please put our hands together. Moet Bonsal, Matt Bernacki, Thomas Hoffweber, Boye Kim, Mark McNeely. One more time, we want to thank all of you for being here today. You out there in the ether, we know you're out there. You're not just virtual. Kat Nichols, thank you so much. Paul Benici. Thank you to the Carolina alumni for hosting us, and we hope to see you soon. Consider this.